Hello and welcome to episode 70 of the Low Back Pain Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Grant Elliott with Rehab Fix Online Low Back Program. And today's topic is actually a Facebook Q&A. Today, I will be going through direct questions that you guys have asked me in our private Facebook group called Rehab Fix Low Back Program. I put up a prompt earlier this week and I said, hey, anyone, any questions, post them here. I'm going to do a Q&A. So that's what this is. I think I'm probably going to do this maybe once a month, once every, I don't know, six weeks, eight weeks, something like that to give back to you guys. So if you are not on my private Facebook group, it is a way to get answers to your questions just like this. You can ask me those questions directly and I'll answer them in this format. I also post exclusive content in there. We have our free Sataka guide, our step-by-step Sataka guide. We have other free guides as well, and you can interact with me and my team. So you need to join for this reason alone. So we are going to go through your guys' questions one by one, and I'm going to give you an in-depth answer. Not sure how long this is going to take. Maybe this will be quick. Maybe it'll be slow. I don't know. We will find out together right now. So let's get right into it. Maya. Maya from Dubai. Maya from Dubai asks... What is the reason for flare-ups? Leaving out the emotional reason. Sounds like she's very aware that emotional things play a toll um, with uh, with flare-ups. So what is the reason for flare-ups? I mean, why do they keep coming back every few months or years? Is it because the back muscles aren't strong enough to hold the bulge? And how do you address it? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Maya. So um, you did say to exclude the emotional stuff. So... I'll exclude that. Flare-ups are caused by many different types of stressors, physical stressors and mental stressors. Physical stressors can include food, your diet. It can also, so input, right? Uh, It can also be affected by output, what you're doing, what movements you're doing, what activities you're doing, what exertion you are putting forth, okay? So in that particular category, if we're going to eliminate everything else because there's a lot of things that can affect flare-ups if we're going to eliminate all of that and we're going to purely focus on physical things like movements and muscles and strength and joints like those things that cause flare-ups you relate this to are the muscles not strong enough to hold the bulge so here's here's my answer for you okay probably about 90 percent of the clients that we work with say the same thing they say hey i went to pt i went to cairo the chiropractor, quick appointments, just adjustments. And of course, not once again, with these examples, guys, not all providers do this. 90, probably 98% of providers are standard, just typical. Probably 2% of providers are, are, are really good, I would say. And that includes my own field, all right? So most people, most people who go to most chiropractors, quick adjustments, temporary relief comes back by that evening or the next day. Most people, most physical therapy clinics, some massage, some e-stim, ultrasound, a couple simple exercises, usually some simple basic, you know, glute and core exercises, helps temporarily, maybe makes them feel better for a few weeks and then they bend over to pick something up or they go back to the gym and they just flare up and they're on this cycle. They feel good, feel good, go ahead and try something, flare back up. Feel good, feel good, feel good. Hey, I'm confident enough to go on a hike, flare back up. And it's that routine for weeks, months, years pretty much every single person that we talk to. And the reason is quite obvious. It's not because the muscles are not strong enough to hold the bulge. Don't think of it that way. Muscles do not hold a bulge in, okay? If muscle strength was the reason for keeping a bulge, a disc bulge, or a low back issue healthy, then powerlifters with the strongest cores and strongest low backs ever would not get low back pain. Strong men who have the strongest core, strongest low backs ever, they're deadlifting thousands of pounds, would not get low back pain bodybuilders who shape everything and grow as much muscle as possible, they would not get low back pain. But guess what? These individuals get back pain every single day. Okay. So strength is not the reason for your back pain. It's not the solution for your low back pain. Okay. It can be an essential part of the recovery process. If you're deconditioned, if your discs have not been loaded and those joints and tissues haven't been, you know, adapted in a long time, then of course, phasing back into squatting and deadlifting should be an essential part of your program as it is ours. Every single one of our clients is squatting and deadlifting by the halfway mark. That's the standard we set for everybody, give or take, depending on where you're at. This is a customized thing, but yes, you need to get into strength work, but that's to help solidify the changes 
after you've addressed the root of the issue. So why are you getting flare-ups? Because the root of the issue isn't being addressed. Simple as that. If you have an obvious disc obstruction, which majority of our clients do, and you're experiencing what majority of our clients do, which is extra stiff first thing in the morning. The longer you sit, the more you feel it. If you've sat for a really long time, sometimes stiff to stand up straight. Bending over to put your socks and shoes on first thing in the morning is extra tight. This is almost classically a posterior disc obstruction. And we need to get that obstruction out of there. We got to load it out of there. We got to push it out of there. Maybe that involves some repetitive end range movement. Maybe that involves some uh, nerve openers and closers. Maybe that involves some nerve flossing. Maybe that involves other particular motions that we would include for you, depending on your assessment. Okay, you have to address that issue first. First, if that issue is not addressed, if the root of the issue is not addressed, if that disc obstruction is still there, if that lack of motion is still there, if that nerve root irritation is still there, but you're just trying to strengthen over it, you're trying to cover it up. It's just like a pain medication, just like a steroid injection. Let's just cover it up. Sure, you can't go wrong getting strong, and I'm not saying that strength exercises is, a, is the equivalent to opioids, okay? Don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. But you're just trying to cover it up. Hey, let's pack this thing as, you know, as much as possible with support, but let's let the foundation still be weak. Okay, so weak foundation, but just pack it as much as we can around it. Eventually, it's still going to crumble. The, the foundation has not been addressed appropriately. So you don't keep flaring up because of you your muscles being weak. It's not it at all. You don't keep flaring up because you're not strong enough. You don't keep flaring up because your hamstrings are too tight or your glutes are too weak. That's not why you keep flaring up. You keep flaring up because you're not addressing the root of the issue. And most likely that obstruction is not being resolved. And you're not being progressed through all of the movements that would fully restore that range of motion and then knowing what to do to maintain that range of motion and then building the strength on top of it. It's as simple as that. Okay. Um, Exactly. How do we address it? I don't know, Maya, because you're not our client. (laughs) So frankly, I don't, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Uh, We would have to go through an assessment. We'd have to find what gives you results live during our assessment because that's what we do. We get results immediately. And then we, we build your plan based on that. Then we would know how to address that. But that's what a proper assessment is for. No cookie cutter programs, guys. If you're buying something and it's pre-made, you need to, you never talk to anyone throughout the process. It's probably not going to work for you. Low back issues are serious. You need a serious program. You need people who take it serious and who take you serious. Next question. Fabienne, Fabienne from Germany. You did not put where you're from, but I know you're from Germany because we met and we got results and you need to sign up for the program. Yes, I did just say that. You need to sign up because dealing with these sciatic issues is, is for this long is, is way too long. Okay. Let me help you. (laughs) Let my team help you. What are your thoughts of releasing once in a while trigger points in tight areas? Um, I'm going to be very blunt with this. I think it's a huge waste of time. Okay. Trigger points are made in the brain, right? Trigger points are not just created out of thin air because your body felt like creating a knot. Okay. Oh, I have a knot in my trap. I have a knot in my QL. I have a knot in my glute mead. Um, my body just felt like creating it. So I'm going to address that. It's the same thing as a symptom. It's the same thing as if someone has sciatica and they feel the sciatica going down to their hamstring or their calf, they go to a provider and the provider says, all right, we're going to massage your calf and your hamstring. Not an effective approach. The sciatica is coming from the disc and the nerve root in the low back. If you're just touching the hamstring and touching the calf, you're not doing anything. You're just touching where it hurts. You're just touching where their symptoms are. But the calf and hamstring have nothing to do with the sciatica. Absolutely nothing at all. It's just a location of a symptom. Trigger points are the same thing. Trigger points are locations of symptoms. They're not problems on their own, though. If you have a trigger point in your QL, trigger point in your trap, trigger point in your glute meat, it's because something else is going on to create that trigger point. I want you to think about trigger points as a, as a symptom of instability or dysfunction elsewhere. Okay. You address that instability or that dysfunction at the root trigger point goes away. Simple as that. It goes away. A lot of people don't have trigger points in their traps, in their rhomboids, that kind of region. You go through some cervical stabilizing movements, some scap stabilizing, some, you know, anterior serratus work, stuff like that. All of a sudden the trigger points are going away. The trigger points that they've been getting dry needled uh, for weeks and months. Same thing with the low back. 
almost every single person we work with has trigger points and spasms in their QL in glute med, almost every single person, but they just go into someone and getting them, you know, pushed out, you know, on a cyclical basis. Well, as soon as we start addressing their core function, their low back function, moving the disc the way it wants to go, moving the nerve the way it wants to go, making the disc and nerve happy, all of a sudden their trigger points are gone. Trigger points are a symptom of what is occurring. If you're going to someone for trigger point injections, massage work on um, trigger points, uh, dry needling on trigger points, of course, not every single situation right? There's going to be some context that applies here, but majority of the time it's a waste of time. All right. You're, you're chasing symptoms. You're chasing pain. Let's not chase symptoms around. Let's address the root of the issue. Fabian, let me help you. All right. Next question. Stacy, Stacy asks, Stacy, I don't know where you're from. You did not leave a comment where you're from. Ah, come on guys. Next time, let me know where you're from. I'd love to shout you out to show the reach that we have with this podcast and with this group. How to safely add in more rotation, like supine spinal twist. Rotation or reaching back are only triggers at this point. Yes, for a lot of people with sensitive discs, rotation is sensitive. We just got a new client today from Texas. He wants to get back to golf. Every time he goes back to golf, it's fearful. He gets flared up the next day, regrets it. Yeah, rotational forces can be a lot, especially for sensitive discs. Through our program, what we do is we, first off, load the disc, we make the disc happy, we go through nerve openers, nerve closers, mobilize the nerve, make sure the nerve is happy too, so there's uh, no more disc obstruction, there's no more nerve tension, we make sure that's completely gone, then we slowly work into the hips, work on hip mobility, hip stability, then work into the core, make sure our core function, breathing patterns, belly breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, we know how to carry those movements over to squats and deadlifts, then at that point, we work on anti-rotation. So we'll go through anti-rotation work for individuals that have rotational sensitivities, okay? So we bring it into that point. After that, people can usually return to golf, no problem. Just like that, okay? But how to safely add in more rotation? Well, I would answer your question with what I just said. If you're finding that rotational exercises are uncomfortable to you, I'm not saying to not avoid rotation, but first, work on anti-rotation. Work on anti-rotation first, Stacy. And then you might find when you slowly work back into rotation mobility movements, it's not as sensitive, okay? Work on anti-rotation for a few weeks and then go back to rotational mobility movements. It'll feel better, all right? What are some quick examples of anti-rotation movements? Palov press, palov walk, palov march, um, single arm plank, single leg plank, a single arm TRX hold, like leaning back, like an inverted row, right? Except you're holding with one arm. Um, those are a whole bunch of anti-rotation movements. Anything that is trying to make your body rotate, but you're not letting it, that's an anti-rotation movement. So work on those first. You're going to notice the rotation won't be as sensitive. Then when you start to reintegrate rotation, then go to the point of tension as long as it gets easier and easier every time, just continue to push uh, through that, assuming that's the trend that continues. Of course, if you haven't addressed the root of the issue though, none of these things will work. I'm assuming you've addressed the root of the issue. That is the process you would do after, okay? Jennifer, Jennifer from Connecticut asks, facet arthropathy in bulging discs from L3 to S1, Straightening of lumbar lordosis as well. 20 years of pain. No sciatica though. Double fusion recommended. It seems like flexion would be best for facet arthropathy relief. Uh Haha. I'm going to talk about that. But extension is best for bulging discs. So it seems like it would be helpful for one problem. It would make the other problem worse. I've done PT, injections, acupuncture, and steroids over the years with very little success. Surgeon says that no amount of PT will help. Well... I don't know your exact circumstance, Jennifer, because you're not one of our clients. However, if a surgeon, you know, told someone, hey, no amount of PT will help you, eh, I don't really like that statement because it's just not an encouraging statement. Like they, they could think that, like they could think, hey, this isn't, you know, this isn't a conservative therapy case. Like this is a surgical case. Like they could think that, but to tell someone, hey, no amount of PT is going to help you. Like, come on, like have some, you know, have some bedside manner. Like that's just... That's not an encouraging thing to say to someone. Don't say that, guys. Don't say that to people. It's not nice, and 99% of the time, it's not true. So 
All right, the point that Jennifer is getting at here is a lot of people hear about extension movements for discs, how it can be helpful if you have the right progressions, if you have the right volume, if you have the right frequency. <laughs> yes, it can be. Okay, a lot of people just take that off the internet, do it once a day, and then it doesn't work for me. Well, no wonder. <laughs> you have no plan for it. But anyway, getting back to the point here, Jennifer says, extension can be good for bulging discs, but I was told that that was bad for facets. Flexion can be good for facets, but I was told that was bad for discs. Conflicting information, right? That's why we don't make decisions based on diagnoses. <laughs> right there. Right there. One diagnosis and one textbook says this is good. One diagnosis and another textbook says this is good. They conflict. Oh my gosh, what do we do? We don't listen to the textbook. We don't listen to the diagnosis. We listen to you, Jennifer. We listen to you. What do you feel? What makes you feel better? What progressions do you feel good doing? What is giving you less pain, more movement? That's what we're going to do. So I would immediately remove that notion from your mind. I would do one of the movements, see how you feel. Do flexion. Does it make you feel better? Progress it. Do extension. Does it make you feel better? Progress it. And also, a lot of people being told that facet arthropathy needs flexion, not extension. I mean, that's just not, that's just not true. That's just not true. The clinical criteria for individuals with facet syndrome, true facet syndrome, I'm a little bit rusty on it. So if someone's going to fact check me, I'm, I'm probably going to be a little bit off here. But uh, above the age of 60, um, relief upon you know lying supine or prone, getting away from gravity, uh, increase of pain upon standing, axially loading those facets, uh, no pain with flexion and uh, no significant pain with extension either. It's it's all based on axle loading with uh, age-related uh, degradation of these regions. Now, I'm not a fan of that term either, degenerative discs, degenerative facets. I'm not a fan of that either, but that's the cl clinical criteria for facet syndrome. Um, most people aren't going to fall into that criteria, but extension doesn't automatically mean it's going to make facets bad. We've had tons of clients that were told, oh, I, I was told I have facet syndrome. I shouldn't do extension. Guess what helped them? <laughs> extension. We've had tons of people who said, oh, I have, you know, disc problems. And I was told that flexion was bad. Well, guess what? We found out that disc or, or sorry, disc problems. They found out that flexion was bad. Well, we found that flexion was actually part of the recovery process for some people, not a lot of them. They're the lower subgroup, but sometimes, yes, that's why you need a, you need a good assessment. You're not your diagnosis. No recommendation No recommendation should be made based on just the names of something. It's, it's, it's crazy. That's not, that's not good medicine. All right. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that helps you, but do one of them and see how you feel. <laughs> Let your body tell you what's going to work. Not a diagnosis, not a textbook. Get a proper assessment, Jennifer. Would love to help. Derek from Southern California. Last year in July, I didn't listen to my body and I went too heavy too often in the gym, not respecting load management. Heck yeah, I can tell you're listening to the content and you are learning. Congrats, Derek. You already know more than like 90% of doctors out there. I have a minor pain around my left SI joint ever since. By the way, guys, when I make comments like that, don't take it offensively, okay? I'm a doctor. I'm, I talk about my own field all the time. Okay. And it's true. 90% of providers don't know anything about load management or exercise or strength, con strength and conditioning principles. It, it's the truth. Okay. I'm, but I'm not insulting, like, I'm not like insulting your doctor or your brother-in-law or your sister if they're a, if they're a doctor. Okay. Um, anyway, back to the question. I have a minor pain around my left SI joint ever since, ever since this heavy lifting too often. Sometimes I feel minor sciatica. Not too painful, but very annoying. It is triggered mainly with lumbar rotation. Not too sure what it is, possibly herniated disc. I mean, Derek, if you're listening to this podcast, I literally just discussed that with um, Stacy's question. Rotation. Yeah. If you're going really heavy in the gym really often, a lot of times we'll hear clients say, hey, you know, heavy squat day, heavy deadlift day, felt a pop, really tight the next day, so stiff getting out of bed ever since it hasn't been the same. And then rotation is sensitive with that. Yeah, that's, that's probably a disc issue. I don't want to say a herniated disc because it sounds scary. I'd rather just call it disc irritation. Disc irritation is really, really common. So I'd rather just call it that just for, you know, anti-nocebic effects. 
But um, if you're saying you feel pain around the left SI joint with some sciatica, I would be willing to guarantee you then that you don't have anything wrong with your SI joint. I'd be willing to bet that the referral from the lower back that is causing the sciatica is also increasing pain as a symptom in the SI joint region. This is a common thing we get asked about a lot. Hey, Grant, I have SI joint pain because I have pain around my SI joint. No, just because you have pain around your SI joint does not mean you have SI joint pain. They are not equal. A lot of people with low back issues that have sciatica, radiation to the glute, radiation down the hamstring will also get pain through their SI joint. It's because nerve referral can go through that path. You know, once again, don't confuse the site of symptoms with the site of the problem. All right. Big confusion. So for you, Derek, I would of course have to ask some more questions. So let me ask those questions. Let's assume you are like a lot of other clients, pretty stiff first thing in the morning really tight bending over to put your socks and shoes on. You might notice that that leg with sciatica, I'm assuming that left side, probably extra tight when you lift that leg up to put your socks and shoes on. You've been sitting for a long time, start to feel increase. When you've been sitting for a long time, you go to stand up or get out of a car and oh, kind of tight getting up. If you have all those things, yep, you, you probably have a herniated disc. With that lumbar rotation sensitive sensitivity, yeah, that would, that would add to it. And also, if you've ever noticed increased discomfort with coughing, sneezing, those types of things, yep, probably a disc issue. But guess what? That's what we specialize in. So uh, reach back out if you're ready to go, man. Sandra. Sandra asks, what's the difference between your program and physical therapy? Sandra is someone who's actually uh, left a lot of comments on her page and has reached out multiple times for our help but hasn't pulled the trigger yet. So Sandra, here's me encouraging you and pushing you. Make that commitment in yourself. Get off the sidelines, all right? Jump in the game. You've been hanging around for a little while. It's time to get results, all right? (laughs) You can sit back and ask all the questions you want, but ultimately, until you have a plan and until you're putting in the work, your situation isn't gonna change. But to answer that, what's the difference between our program and physical therapy? We get this question a lot. Physical therapy is a broad term. Any exercise of any kind is physical therapy. Walking is physical therapy, running is physical therapy, squatting is physical therapy, tennis is physical therapy, doing bicep, tricep, calf, foot, core, that's all physical therapy. Physical therapy is just the category of a profession and of an intervention that is based around musculoskeletal movement. That's physical therapy. But most people, when they're going to physical therapy, most of them are going maybe once or twice a week. Most of them are... Um, usually receiving, you know, e and ultrasound or massage or, you know, go walk on a treadmill or whatever. If you're getting physical therapy at a chiropractic clinic, most, once again, I'm using this word purposely, most are going in, getting their, you know, three or four minute appointment, getting their quick adjustments, and then maybe being pushed on to the rehab uh, provider there, maybe doing some quick cord glute movements for a few minutes, and then just saying, hey, just do these when you feel pain but you're given the same exercises every week and nothing's really changing with the way you feel or with the way your rehab is set up. That's what a lot of people feel. So the point here is guidance. What's the difference with our program? You have guidance. You have people who manage low back issues and disc issues and static issues every single day. It's what we specialize in, but you have guidance. You have someone to work with you 24 seven, any day, any time, you're connected. You can text them whenever you want to. You can shoot video messages. You can have us check your form. You have a proper sequence of movements to follow. Every week, you have a structured plan. You are told exactly what to do, when to do it, how often to do it. Every single day, we lay the map out for you. We adjust the plan as we go to make sure it continues your progress. We are tracking your progress methodically every single week and making changes on your program based on that progress. How many, you know, how many exercises should you do? How many reps? How many sets? What's the next one? What's the volume? What's the frequency? What's the load? When are you ready to move on to squatting and deadlifting? When are you ready to move on to those other things? These are questions that people don't get answered other places. This is a highly, highly involved process. We post testimonials every week. You see what we produce it's because you have guidance and structure. I guess that would be the biggest difference, but I guess you'll just have to join and find out. <laughs> Patrick, Patrick from New York. Patrick is a new client of ours. 
doing awesome, pumped for him. He had an awesome assessment. His question is, the wall thoracic hinge, this is an exercise we have in our program, uh, lights up my sciatica. Should I keep pushing through it or stop? I'm on week three of the program. So the wall thoracic hinge movement is basically an upper back thoracic mobility movement that is in a standing position that utilizes a wall as support and your body is going through a hinging pattern. For a lot of people with really sensitive sciatica, which Patrick does and before too long we'll be saying did because when he's done with the program, he'll be crushing it. This can trigger sciatica. Hinging mo- uh, movements can trigger sciatica. So a simple solution is if you're standing, leaning against a wall and performing a thoracic mobi- mobilization movement, a really simple solution, go to the knees. Drop down to the knees. Now that you do not have knee extension, remember knee extension and hip flexion increases nerve tension. That's gonna increase nerve symptoms for most people. Not everyone, but for most. So if you go down to a kneeling position on your knees, now your knees are flexed. Now, even though your hips are still flexed, you've reduced a significant amount of nerve tension. So now you can focus on the shoulders and the upper thoracic spine movement. This particular movement in week three for Patrick is intended to help mobilize the thoracic spine so we can take pressure off the lower back and improve the function of our lower back rehab. That's why we're working on this in week three for you, Patrick. And this is a easy way that you can reduce that nerve tension and focus on that thoracic spine. Uh, next question from Patrick as well. Thoughts on driving a manual car if suffer from symptoms on the left side, which is a leg that, you, that it is used to press the clutch in. So um, thoughts on that? I mean, you have to drive the car, right? <laughs> you have no choice. You got to drive the car. So if that's the leg you got to use, it's a leg you got to use. The further away that seat is from the clutch, though, the more nerve tension you're going to have because the straighter your leg is. I kind of just gave that example with that last exercise, right? So if you're sitting really far back and you're, extent, you're fully extending that knee, it's going to put a little bit more nerve tension. So the closer you are, and I don't want to mess up your driving position here, of course, but the closer you are to that clutch, the more your knee is going to be bent and the less nerve tension is going to be placed on it. So, um, there's probably not much more you can do in a situation like that without, you know, putting like yourself at a health risk or safety risk rather from messing up your driving position. We don't want to mess that up. So for now, I really want to worry about it because this is a symptom as we get through the program. I bet within a couple months, that's not going to be a problem for you because you're in the program. (laughs) And last question, Matt from the UK, from England specifically, why do neurosurgeons recommend back surgery for disc herniation, which leads to sciatica in many cases, like mine, if a tailored and bespoke rehabilitation plan, like what Rehab Fix can offer, can have such good results to improve the injury? Well, I mean, I'm going to give you an answer from both sides here, Matt. So once again, we speak in majorities here. There are some incredible surgeons out there, and the surgeons who follow clinical guidelines, who are good at what they do, are treasures to the healthcare system, just like chiropractors who follow the evidence and follow clinical guidelines are treasures to the profession and to our healthcare system. Fill in the gap for massage therapists, physical therapists, um, anyone, any medical provider who follows clinical guidelines, who's evidence-based, who's good at what they do, is a treasure to the healthcare field, right? But that's the, that's the minority of providers. That's the vast minority of providers. The majority of providers are not great. And so majority of surgeons, no matter what kind of surgeon they are, they're, they're pretty quick to operate one, because that's what they get paid to do, right? Like you can't blame them for that. They're trying to put food on the table and pay back their, uh, student loans. Like we all are. Anyone with a DR next to their name gets a big fat stack of loans to pay back. So you can't blame them for doing that. They're trying to make a living, right? But also it's what they're trained to do. Take an image. You see something, cut it out. That's that's what they're trained to do. So like it's it's hard to blame them, right? It's hard to that's hard to blame them. But the best ones are the ones who take a step back and they say, you know what? You haven't exhausted this, this, or this, or this. I'm not going to even consider operating until you've exhausted all these things, changed your lifestyle habits, worked through a significant rehab plan, worked with this provider, that provider. Then we can consider surgery. That's what the top surgeons in the world do. So. 
Why do neurosurgeons recommend back surgery for disc herniation? Because it's what they're trained to do. If you have pain, if you want their help, and if they can get paid to do it, they're probably going to do it. That's just the way that it is. However, as we know, with a proper rehabilitative program, 97% of disc herniations can be resolved without surgery. This was a massive study with over 200,000 uh, individuals with disc herniations. 97% were able to recover without surgery. So surgery is a last resort. should always be a last resort. Of course, this depends on context. I've made a podcast before where I discussed signs and symptoms of a very, very serious low back issue where you should get surgery immediately. I've discussed that in a previous podcast. If you want to listen to that, I'm looking at my notes right now. I believe that was episode, um, oh, just our last one, 69, I believe. 69 uh, was where I discussed that. Um, it's important to understand because you need to know when it's indicated, of course, but very, very, very few people, it, it's indicated. Very few, 97% recover without surgery. All right, so once again, follow the evidence, follow the clinical guidelines, and you'll be steered the right direction. So get with a rehab program that's trusted, that you feel connected to, that you feel the individual is speaking the same language as you, who practices what they preach. If you want to get back into deadlifting, squatting, and exercise as a whole, look at what your provider's doing. Are they doing those things? Are they fit? Do they eat well? Do they exercise? If not, I don't know. You know, that's that's a personal decision. If if I'm going to have a mentor, I expect my mentors to be someone who I want to be. I want to look at that mentor and say, I love this quality about you. I love this advice that you give. I see that you are living that. I want to be like you. I want to be like my mentors. There are certain aspects or characteristics of them that I want to obtain. Your doctors and your rehab coaches are your mentors. That's how you should look at them. If you're not looking at them and saying, hey, you possess this in your life, in your attitude, in your character, and I want that. I want more of that. It, it, it's it's just hard. It, it's 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 going to be hard to do what they say. It's going to be hard to trust their plan. It's going to be hard to feel like you're on the same page with things. Not all the time, of course, but just something to consider. Okay, get with the plan that's serious. Get with the plan where people really, really value their time, value your time. Value results, most importantly, who focused on results, are results driven, and who listen to you. Find someone who does that, and you found a diamond in the rough. So that is our Facebook Q&A, guys. That ended up being, let's see how long this was, 34 minutes. Wow, that's pretty good. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to the end. Obviously, you value what I have to say if you listen this long, so I appreciate that. And if you would like more information about how we can help you with disc issues, sciatica issues, go to the link in the show notes, submit an application on my website, join my private Facebook group, Rehab Fix Low Back Program, and get our free sciatica guide so that you can learn the beginning stages of what we take our clients through around the world, around the world to resolve their disc and sciatica issues. You can kind of see a glimpse of, of what we do and give you some answers And you can make that decision for yourself if you're ready to take that next step into something serious and get the answers, you know, skip, skip the line, right? Don't, don't try to figure this out on your own for the next five, 10 years, skip the line, go right to the results, get it over with. That's what we're here for. And we value your time. We value your health and we're here to make results happen. If you are watching on YouTube, please like comment and subscribe. It greatly helps the channel grow. Please It really, really helps. If you are listening on your favorite podcast platform, please leave a five-star rating and review. Please, it really, really helps. As always, move more, move in nature, move in the sun. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.